Many thanks to everybody for coming, especially before finals. And uh, today it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Uh, Britt Almer, who is a professor in the Department of Computer Science and the Center for Computation and Technology here at LSU. Uh, Dr. Almer completed his PhD at MIT in uh, tangible uh, interfaces group when he was working on tangible interfaces. And after that, he held um, positions at multiple institutions across three continents. Uh, this is what I found. California, Germany, Japan, Hong Kong, and now Louisiana. Uh, at CCT, he leads the uh, cultural computing uh, focus area, which involves currently about 15 faculty from different departments at LSU, uh, arts, music, um, engineering, business, mass communication. He also serves as a director for the bioinformatics core at the Louisiana Biomedical Research Network, who is one of our sponsors. And his research interests include um, tangible interfaces and broadly defined computational science and visualization. He's also interested in computer art, craft, and design. And today he will show us how to use an interactive supercomputing to address some problems in computational genomics using tangible interfaces. Thank you, Professor Berlinski, for that very kind introduction, and Professor Brown and all of the other organizers, and especially to all of you uh, here today, I know, on the eve of exams, so it's uh, great to share, share an hour with you. Uh, the talk I'll be giving today is one that uh, Professor Miriam Konkel and I uh, presented at Wellesley uh, a little while ago, and I've adapted for the present purposes. I'm afraid that with, with me here, you're going to have a little bit less biology and a little bit more other sorts of things, but uh, we'll try to make it all come together. Uh, so, uh, as Professor Berlinski said, I've had sort of an uh, unusual course in coming here. You will see a variety of places, a variety of topics. Uh, you will not see until you get to the very bottom of very much biology. And so uh, at the beginning of the talk, I'd like to give a little bit of preface what brings me here today to a computational biology uh, series. Um, way back as an undergrad in computer engineering, um, I was a part of an honors program at Illinois. And the very first semester I was there, I had the great opportunity to hack DNA, to get a wet bench and run restriction enzymes. Um, I think that one of from my perspective, one of the greatest things about being an undergrad is not necessarily what happens in the middle of your degree, but all of the other complementary courses that hopefully you're getting a chance for with your electives. And so I found that really, really cool uh, way back 20-some-odd uh, years ago. Um, and uh, when I came here, uh, my wife had come as a postdoctoral researcher in the Biological Computation and Visualization Center, BCVC. And she was given an interesting opportunity that um, sort of has shaped my course as well, that there was an exciting project that we could be a part of if we could come up with a certain result in about two weeks. And this had something to do with biology and something to do with computation. And she had a nice 800 megahertz, you know, single core computer. And we started calculating if we did everything right, how long would we need, you know, so that we could run it a few times and get everything right within about two weeks. And we discovered that it would take somewhere between 20 and 30 years, if we made no mistakes, to get the result that we had two weeks or so to, to, to gain. And so that was uh, exciting to me, because for decades I'd been around the fringes of supercomputing, and, uh, but I hadn't really fully gotten my hands wet. And so biology provided uh, that opportunity for us. And so that work uh, was uh, the first work uh, we had done with the rhesus uh, genome. Uh, we've since worked with Orang, Gibbon, uh, Marmoset, and a number of others. She's done far more than this. Um, each of these projects, for me, has ended up being seven, eight hundred hours of programming, arms dirty. That, that pales in a comparison with a couple thousand hours she'll end up putting on the wet bench side. Uh, but this has sort of taught me a couple different sorts of things. Now, 700 hours or a couple thousand hours may sound like a lot, uh, but that first uh, rhesus project had about 250 co-authors, each of who were doing similar amounts or more. When Miriam's work on the Thousand Genomes Project, there were somewhere between six and 700 authors, all doing similar amounts. And so as a relatively new father uh, to a beautiful 14-month-old daughter, you hear about these phrases, it takes a village to raise a child. And so I'm sort of understanding what that means in the uh, literal parentage sense. But I think especially with a lot of these big 
uh, biology projects. There's again this notion of it taking a village, it taking a number of different uh, people with different perspectives, different skills at the whole end of the, that frame. And at some level, uh, part of the sponsorship of the series and part of my uh, main biology role these days um, is exactly one of these takes a village uh, sorts of models. There is an enterprise called the Louisiana Biomedical Research Network that spans uh, in our renewal, uh, hopefully, 13 different campuses around the state. And I think one of the, the notions about why the National Institute of Health is, or Institutes of Health are interested in funding these sorts of activities is that some institutions, that village exists and all of the different faculty doing the related work are already there and it becomes easy to come in with a, even a very ambitious project and get traction. In Louisiana, like with many other states, we have a more distributed uh, set of activities. And we have people like Berlinski here, people at Shreveport, people others. But, but at one campus, we are sort of just on the cusp of reaching critical mass. And so uh, my activities uh, leading computational biology activities within Elbrun are helping assemble at least four campuses worth of experts. So some amazing folks in Shreveport who are uh, world-class folks where visualization meets biology. Uh, some folks in uh, Ruston at Tech uh, who are uh, for data mining, uh, really at a world level with that. Uh, folks of biostatistics at New Orleans and working together with John Quibodeau and others, uh, the technology infrastructure that lets us all uh, communicate, uh, give lectures like this, uh, work with students across the different sites um, to reach that critical mass. That's just, again, some of the framing uh, for the Elburn activities, which uh, I think uh, provide the pizza, uh, perhaps, today. Or maybe that's the CCP side. I, I forget which. But let me tell you a little bit more about the kinds of biology that I've been mentioning, and then tell you, uh, I suspect almost all of you will uh, recognize some of the biology. Fewer of you may be familiar with what the heck a tangible interface is, and why it would have anything to do with the future of biology and perhaps humanity itself. So, so we'll get to that in about 10 minutes or so, perhaps. Uh, this is probably up there in the top left, one of the most used figures of the last decade or so, I think, in uh, the computational biology space. Uh, in computation, we've been really excited for a half century about something we call Moore's Law. And Moore's Law talks about certain kinds of doubling every 18 months or so that happens with transistor counts, other sorts of things. And it, it, if you think about that doubling, that creates an exponential curve. What I like even more than the doubling every 18 months or so is if you look out at the decades, that talks about a factor of 100 per decade. So every decade we get about 100 times more something. For about 40 years that was a sort of faster clock rates and more sophisticated processors. Right around the time I came to LSU in 2005, there was sort of for the first time in a half century this right angle turn. And processors in some ways started getting slower but having more of them. So having two cores, 40 cores, the newest uh, super MIC machine that I think is sort of halfway unveiled and uh, I think uh, uh, Miko was probably one of the first to go into production has as many as 140 different processor elements per node rather than the one that was common uh, so, so for so long. But as fast, as exciting as Moore's Law has been, uh, that funny green thing is uh, looking at sequencing costs. And so if you just want to think of sort of a rule of orders of magnitude uh, around 2000 when the first human genome project was in some respects completed, you could say the cost was, oh, let's say two to four billion dollars per genome. <laughs> Today it's perhaps two to four thousand dollars per genome. Billion, thousand, you have, what, a factor of roughly a million there in, uh, what, 15 years or so? That is exciting and interesting and transformative and dangerous and scary and uh, has a lot of really powerful dimensions, uh, I think, without exaggeration, for the whole future of humanity. And so we'll go through that and end up with some exciting elements of that at the end. But uh, a little bit more modestly, let me tell you about the particular types of computational genomics I'm most involved with in Peru, that if you look at each one of our genomes and you try to say what's in there, one of the most surprising things to me is every three to five years it seems like this sort of pie chart is very much changing. And so I think this pie chart was three or four years ago, and even in that time, it's become very much updated. But one notion of what codes for proteins, your flesh and blood, is that perhaps on the order of 1.6% of your genome uh, codes for that, which maybe intuition would have suggested would be the majority. 
and then some roughly fifty percent or so are recognizable mobile elements. these elements, they might be a hundred base pairs, they might be a few thousand base pairs you might have just a few of a certain kind it might be our good friends alu where you have maybe a million of these different elements and one in twenty of us would have a novel mutation that our parents don't have with that particular alu those who made it to living for those who didn't make it to a viable embryo perhaps it was a rather larger uh, percentage that's not really well known and then of the other fifty percent i think people still talk about it as a kind of dark matter and there's a very good chance most of that may once have been mobile elements that have degraded to a point that we no longer can adequately recognize them. So again, that in itself is already exciting. And it's sort of what I've said is already probably uh, older biology conceptions of this. That was a really exciting project some of you may have heard of a couple years ago called ENCODE that started suggesting, ah, maybe that's not all just junk and non-functional. Maybe there's a heck of a lot of signal where once we thought there was mostly noise. But it becomes very interesting. It, it turns out, in my way of understanding, which again, I'm not coming from a biologist's perspective, but the computational side, that around 2000, when we're blowing the trumpets, the Human Genome Project is complete. Maybe with one genome sequence, we can't really tell almost anything at all about what's inside. And it's only when we come to larger numbers of very different genomes, different primates, different non-primates, different people, different healthy people, maybe non-healthy people. It's only through the contrast, perhaps, and looking at what is similar and what is different that we really can begin peeling back the layers of the onion and understanding this in, in greater detail. Um, so my first uh, experience with this, as I mentioned, was with the rhesus uh, uh, genome. Uh, the rhesus uh, is an interesting genome in a, a number of different ways. Uh, does anyone happen to know where the largest population of uh, rhesus macaques in North America might be? Hands high? Would they be roaming the coasts of California, climbing uh, the valleys and mountains in Wyoming? Any, any guesses what state might have the largest population of rhesus macaque? Uh, look down and tell us what state you might be in. Louisiana. Why? Anyone? No. Uh, Shantanu, I think you're not from Louisiana. Are they uh, uh, rhesus macaque? Are you familiar with them from India? Where do you most often see them? Everywhere is the answer. So Louisiana is a little bit different in Leicester, and I think it's uh, Covington where there's a primate center, and there are a whole bunch of them there. Um, any idea why there are a whole bunch of them in Covington? Yes. But why are they there? But why are they relevant to research? HIV studies, for example. Why would they be doing that with rhesus macaque? Good. Beautiful answers. I would say that you're a plant, but I'm not. I, I, don't, I don't think we've prearranged this conversation. The $40 I had into you in advance, in addition, the pizza didn't know. So no, OK, very good. So you mentioned HIV, which is a significant disease, yes? Now, we would like to be able to understand that disease better without impacting any living creatures. Um, we certainly don't give that to humans. Even creatures uh, that are most similar to humans, I think chimpanzees just in the last year or so are no longer allowed by NIH to be used in any form of biomedical research because they are so similar to us. The rhesus macaque is sort of at this interesting, funny point that it's relatively similar to us, but enough in number and sort of distance that it sort of reaches a kind of sweet spot. And my understanding is, per your lead, that if there is ever a cure for HIV, citing stuff in the news just in the last uh, two days about HIV, maybe it's getting a little calmer and acclimating to its hosts, different things, that perhaps it will be through those monkeys at Covington and then through our ability to computationally understand. So uh, the general for chimpanzees and this newly sequenced genome for the rhesus. And we looked at this triple alignment, try to align up all the genes that look similar. And then we have some gaps in between where things lined up. And so we looked, we aimed these uh, large machines at these 400,000 or so gaps and tried to look for things that we could recognize, mobile elements. And what we ended up finding, to my understanding, which is again very partial, you'll have to ask Miriam and others if you really want to get into the details, 
is that the relative numbers of different types of mobile elements between rhesus, chimpanzee, and human were relatively similar. They were relatively similar levels. And so I'll jump to a slightly more recent project. Uh, the next uh, big genome I tackled with Miriam and others was the orang. And so we went in, oh, I've participated in a genome project. I think I understand this. This isn't so difficult. Uh, there were only four million files that we had to arrange and process in different ways. We've got this down pat. And um, we didn't find almost any of what we were looking for. We were looking for these alus, and we expected the new species-specific alus to be of similar proportion to the new species-specific alus uh, back in chimpanzee, rhesus, and human. And they weren't. We found almost none. And I was upset with myself, and my wife was upset with me, and there was a lot of upsetness going on, because clearly, we're not honest, they didn't find any either. And so you're seeing uh, a specific uh, mobile element alu. You're seeing a certain uh, bar with the, the human and another bar with chimpanzee, and you're seeing it's very, very small with alu. And so that ended up becoming, uh, for that particular cover article of Nature, one of the most surprising results. You know, not surprising results are interesting, but to really sell this in different audiences, it's really fun if you discover something. And this sort of business about discovering something that wasn't there was a big surprise to me and um, helped drove that particular work. So uh, other sorts of things that you would see. So uh, with the most recent work we've done with Marmoset, this is some work that we uh, published, uh, again, with quite a number of others, uh, both uh, about three or four months ago in Nature Genetics. And we have uh, some new work that Miriam just presented uh, at uh, ASHG in San Diego uh, last month. We start trying to look at these particular mobile elements and understand how they perhaps have evolved over time. And so, again, to get towards the, the detailed biology, you should ask Miriam and others, but if you think about transcribing DNA over and over again, usually we do it right, but every once in a while there's a mistake. Sometimes that mistake is big enough that the creature dies or it's non-viable. But sometimes it's, it's survivable. Uh, sometimes these mobile elements then will have a mutation within them. And if we look at how those mutations accumulate, we can start understanding the divergence from some consensus sequence. And at some level be able to predict how many millions of years ago uh, some particular phenomena occurred. And so what you're seeing with that particular sort of bimodal distribution is that we're able to begin with these sort of embedded in it are all these nice sort of normal Gaussian curves of distribution range. But uh, when you start layering them up in the stacked histogram, you see there's something sort of complicated. And we can, again, understand is our characterization of which mobile elements are similar, which are different. Uh, do we seem to be onto something or not? Um, in fact, uh, to show, well, let me show something else, though. So there we have a nice plot right out of one of our papers. Um, but Day one, hour one, we're messing around with lots of BioPython code, and we have something that looks a little bit more like the top left, which you sort of see a couple big peaks, and then you see a whole lot of mess. And uh, oh, what, 10, 15 hours of coding later, a couple days later, you see the top right. And again, we're sort of coming to terms with that, but um, there's a long sort of winding, uh, ugly path that we ended up needing to take to get from there to here and to the, the much nicer plots, hopefully, that, that we're coming up with from there. And so the question becomes at some level, what do you need? What kinds of skills, what kinds of tools do you need to do to be able to repeat a path like this yourself? Do you need to spend all of that time groveling around in the base of a few thousand lines of BioPython code and trying to understand this or that or the other, which can be done, but certainly isn't what you're going to get the average five-year-old or 50-year-old or 85-year-old into? Or are there other tools that we can think about to begin understanding how to interact with this kind of content? If I weren't here, this is a, one of the latest curves we'd be working with now. And so as an academic, when we start thinking about different kinds of tools, what are ways that complement what's going on in the software level to think about engaging with genomes? So let's look back in time and look back at approaches that have been successful and have evolved over the years. Uh, looking back in time and computation, some people think two years ago was a long time. Some think 20 was uh, a long time. Let me start roughly uh, 10,000 years ago, which I think is, oh, uh, what, a good few thousand years before the invention of the wheel. And let's walk to a different part of the audience to understand what's going on here. 
Uh, you two ladies look like uh, you are both powerful businesswomen in different different stages of, of now. I suspect <laughs> yes, uh, you might have a lot of cows under your. So how many how many how many head of cattle are in your your uh, herds today? Fifty two cattle. Okay, <laughs> on the way to fifty two hundred perhaps. You look like an oil broker. Now, of course, if we're at this time, we're talking about olive oil. So I suspect you have a great deal of olive oil that you want to do business with, yes, perhaps? Sure, sure. So we're going to make a big transaction. And roughly how many cows are you interested in selling off to buy some olive oil? Of your, of, of, are you, gonna, well, you said 52, 52 cows, I think, yes? So, so there are 34 cows that you want to. So the challenge that we have here is we have, oh, what, uh, five to 6,000 years to wait before a central monetary system arrives. So one way is we can wheel those, how many cows were we transacting? 34 cows into this room and sort of shuffle them about with presumably an even larger amount of olive oil uh, in this bartering transaction that we're going to make. That's possible as an approach. But it's pragmatically a little difficult. It's smelly, it's inconvenient, so on and so forth. And so the notion is that's now fairly well understood. For about 5,000 years, the way this was done is we scoop up some earth off the Mesopotamian grounds and we shape it into some sort of a token, first representing perhaps one cow or one amphora of olive oil. And maybe a thousand years later, we come up to the idea we could represent 10 cows and start doing these transactions representing these tokens. Sort of, in a sense, what became algebra and other sorts of things we could imagine. But we're using these physical tokens to represent that. Um, so one of the thoughts occurred to me, gosh, if first principle 10,000 years ago using an object to represent a cow, maybe what we're really wanting to do to think about the future of humanity and genomes is to have that represent a genome, one genome or 10 genomes. And the question I began asking uh, with Miriam a couple days before we gave the talk at Wellesley is, well, hey, 10,000 years ago, did people use objects to represent people? And the answer was yes. And I found two very different kinds of objects that point to the rest of the talk and I think some interesting implications. One of these, the Turinga in Australia, Aboriginal cultures, uh, this would be the most sacred object, perhaps, that you would own. And this object was, in a sense, an embodiment of your soul. And for someone to take this object might be sort of like taking your soul, not something you want to lose. Anyone have speculations for the object on the right? How that object, which again represented people. Any thoughts of particular nuances of how that might have been different, a different approach, a different notion of how an object could represent a person? If I remember correctly, the objects on the right represent a mother and child slave. Different notion about how an object could represent a human. Um, and so again, I think those become very interesting as we move through thinking about interfaces. And we'll, we'll end with that as well. So uh, more recently, not 10,000 years ago, but over the last, oh, let's call it 15, 20 years, these are a series of examples of uh, another form of work that I've been very active with called tangible interfaces that, again, look to these 10,000-year-old technologies and more recent ones People have been using physical tools in science and other sorts of areas for a long time. Tools to think, tools to operate. How can we bring those physical objects to represent digital information, perhaps? Whether it's a genome, whether it's a movie, whether it's 10,000 genomes, 10,000 movies. And I'll give you a few examples of that to make that more tangible. Uh, one of the last ones I did as a doctoral student, I really wanted to do an interface that related to biology at that point. I was interested in thinking about uh, drug discovery and having the physicist, the biologist, the manager, and uh, the, the, the patient having a, a dialogue. But I didn't have the right partner at that point. So uh, my dad was involved in real estate. My parents said, son, it would be great if we used these token tags came out of the ears of cows. So we've got this cow theme running back and forth. And so this object on the left is representing acreage. And the object representing price is on the right. And so we're looking at a scatter plot on the left a geographical plot on the right. Maybe we were looking for clustering or trending, and we didn't sort of see it there. But in two seconds, we grabbed square footage. And oh, there's a nice sort of relationship. We've swapped the axes in the next two seconds. We've added a third parameter in the next few seconds. And so hopefully, 
even though this is sort of a single person scale thing, we're able to very quickly begin juxtaposing different views, different combinations, different representations of information. Those were continuous parameters. Now we've added some discrete parameters. Uh, and continuous parameters as well. We've got mobile homes down there on the bottom and we're seeing them on the outside of the city. Uh, uh, yeah, my laptop with the, the original version of this got stolen so it's a little bit uh, blurry. Uh, here's a discrete versus a discrete uh, parameter view. You get the idea, thinking how could we begin taking these physical objects and using them to very rapidly and exploratorily comb through data. This was another version that actually embedded some early electronics so that we could move the objects left and right next to each other to express Boolean relationships and other more complex relationships and see those funny little histograms on those uh, very old school looking LCD displays. Um, but that's another story. And so that kind of tool uh, compounded with a number of different variations has shaped uh, sort of half of my last decade, the other half being the computational biology. Uh, we've divided our work up into two kinds of aspects. One of them is how do we build these funny kinds of interfaces? It turns out to, to take some real, um, real work. And the second is how to apply it. And we've applied them to two broad areas. One that we talk about is icy STEAM, interactive computational STEM plus the arts, of which computational genomics has been our main example. Okay. Thinking how would these same kinds of tools generalize? And so in the no small plans, uh, uh, world that we live in, uh, one of my fellow undergraduates who uh, tried to recruit me, a uh, uh, guy named Mark Andreessen, did uh, the first wildly successful web browser um, in a computational science context, and it turned out it generalized. And so with these tools, again, we keep trying to see, can we do something that would be great for scientists, but hopefully of a kind that might be good for students and senators and street people and solicitors and all the people touched by biology and by everything else, hoping to generalize. So I'll give you a few more points as that uh, came through and then show how we're beginning to tie that back to uh, biology per se. This was an example. Uh, my first example as a postdoc in Germany. Uh, I was doing a grid and cloud computing project relating to colliding black holes, which is a great strength at this university and actually in Louisiana as well. Anyone uh, know of the colliding black hole with Louisiana with 2016 connection? Anyone have an idea why colliding black holes could relate to Einstein being wrong about some of his most deeply held notions of the universe? So apparently, if some theories were correct of Einstein and others, gravity needs to have a wave-like behavior. And that's sort of hard to directly observe. We don't see, hopefully you're not feeling gravitational waves emanating from my body. Um, but it turns out that if you really wanted to validate this notion, and if the notions of gravity were correct, and again, I'm not a physicist, so take what I'm saying with a grain of salt, um, maybe the biggest sources of these gravitational waves would be colliding black holes on the other side of the universe. Um, and to look for those, you would have an instrument like we have in Livingston Parish, LIGO, roughly a billion dollars invested in it, an instrument that's several miles long by several miles wide, except for the fact there's also one in Washington State, so it's roughly the size, acting like an instrument the size of the continent of North America. They were trying to put one in India as a third one, so you'd have an instrument that was the size of the Earth, virtually, and could triangulate in space. Um, and 2016 is apparently supposed to be the big year. They've invested the billion dollars, and that's where they're either going to find something or not find something. 2016 is just around the corner, so it's exciting time in Louisiana all the way around. But we also were taking these same sorts of funny interfaces and working with some people who were in the business of breaking faces. So I hope that none of us in the room have needed to be in a position to have your face broken. But if your jaw was running at roughly a right angle to where it is now, the way that you were born, you might be interested in doing some facial rearrangement. Um, but before someone breaks your face into roughly 10 to 15, 20 different pieces, both you and your doctor might sometimes have a very small, modest interest in having some idea what you're going to look like when you're put back together again. Yes? This is maxillocranial facial surgery, if you didn't get the, the general notion. Now, these doctors are already working as they've always worked, 120-hour weeks. And you say, I have this simple interface. You just have to sort of master 28 different sorts of things. And after 120 hours of work per week, there's sort of not a lot else to do other things. 
and so our interest there was saying, hey, can we take some of these tangible tools and again have an object representing people? And I hand you three or four cards for the patients you're going to work on. Take those cards, uh, use some funny tools on these sort of stereo views of this uh, spinning face, the simulation of how soft tissue flows over the skull. And maybe again, you could move this quantum leap between the surgeon having zero interaction with a computational tool and some interaction. We're not going to have him do or her do all of the, the lowest level computational stuff in a science or a biology, biomedical domain that matters. Uh, one of the first examples that we did here at LSU, uh, you're seeing a series of students with some evolution of those finally here with us was involved in, in some sense, uh, Elbrin. Uh, one of the biggest technologies we've invested in in the state to weave together the different campuses was video conferencing infrastructure at a time when that was not common especially high resolution tools. So you can have a room full of people and be able to see what the eyeballs are doing in Shreveport. Are people falling asleep? Are they engaged? That matters to carrying on a collaboration. Uh, but even today, we're lucky if we can sort of have a shared PowerPoint, usually not even a shared PowerPoint. In those times, you didn't even have access to your own PowerPoint. You had to, again, call out to the person, next slide, back slide. And so the, the idea here is can we put these tools in different hands all around the state and have people be able to have a good argument, a good conversation around the data. And this is something I think about every week. Uh, Miriam was on a conference call yesterday or this morning, another one tomorrow morning, no, this morning, yesterday morning, maybe there's one tomorrow morning too, where they'll have 50 or 60 people on the phone talking with each other and remotely trying to keep their PowerPoint synchronized. And the notion is in the year 2014, can't we do better than that? Isn't there a way to actually wrestle with the data uh, yeah, through the tools that we might have? A um, couple other variations en route to where we are today. Uh, once we started building those, we did start thinking, how could these generalize? We were one of two people who had an invitation to the first national conference on stimulating and sustaining excitement and discovery in K through 12 education, jointly funded by IBM and the NSA. Um, let me pick on someone else who hasn't spoken so much. You look like you were about to raise your hand. What does the NSA want to have to do with kindergartners? Why is the NSA deeply interested in the, the science interests of kindergartners? You are good. So they'll keep interest. Say more. We have got a hot set of folks in this room. So if, if that kindergartner decides science sucks, it's stupid, I'm not interested, um, there's certain types of work that are, we can think of outsourcing. And there are other sorts of things that are a little bit harder to outsource. And so apparently both NSA, IBM, and others were saying, gosh, outsourcing is great, but uh, as sharp as those people are in all the other places in the world, it's sort of hard to outsource everything. Um, and so uh, here we had a couple kids who were um, playing with Katrina couple here, a couple over a 10 gig link in North Carolina. And that actually, even the most fundamental things, I discovered that describing to a five-year-old what a hurricane is, who's never experienced a hurricane, you're dealing with a phenomenon that's so much larger than a human, it was non-trivial. And so again, we had some 10-year-olds in North Carolina who were trying to explain what was Katrina and look at it over time and see how that interacted with Louisiana. A couple other examples I could talk about. Uh, one of our students, uh, a whole team of students who ended up winning an international prize, uh, again with a colliding somethings or another in an astrophysical sense. Uh, this was a tool with uh, Deepwater Horizon, giving people tools for, again, playing and trying to understand and make sense, make their own models up. Another important element to all of this is it's one thing to take a cooked data set, a data set that's well understood, that's well processed, post processed, and try to give some kind of interaction to it. It's quite another type of thing to take a data set that you don't understand and to potentially, in real time, begin munging that. Uh, so Professor Berlinski, when he was at uh, Georgia Tech, I think even as a postdoc there, you had roughly 10,000 cores that were, you guys were interacting with. And always, you would be doing things in real time. You would snap your fingers, all 10,000 cores would come to your beck and call, and two seconds later, you'd have a result. Yes? Yes. But with, what would another variation that may or may not have often been the case then? There were probably other people who were contending for those 10,000 cores? 
enough people. And so you may end up, it's very common even today, to wait for a week or even a month. If you need all 10,000 cores, a lot of other people need those cores too. And so back in the 1940s and today, the main model for dealing with lots of computers is in batch. You chunk the data over into the queue, hope it runs later. There's one major exception that I'm aware of that I would posit that every person in this room has used in the last 10 hours, I'm gonna make a guess. Um, let's move to the right of the room again. Um, I'm guessing in the last 10 hours, maybe even more recently, you've used an interactive supercomputer and it responded second by second to your beck and call. Do you know which one I have in mind? Supermic? Could be. Have you been controlling Supermic in the last uh, 10 hours at your beck and call, most of the cores? Some of them, okay. Uh, how about you? Interactive supercomputing. You every, let's say that this was actually very keyboard mediated. Every keystroke that you touched, lots of computation was moving and things were coming back. Do you have an idea where I'm heading? Have you done a web search in the last 10 hours? So that idea of proactive search, when you're in a biology class again and you're trying to do Google Cell as uh, Professor uh, uh, now uh, Cato has uh, looked at, or other sorts of uh, a physics class and you're trying to do a simulation, rather than waiting and having a pre-cooked thing, can we bring computation at scale into the classroom, into the research lab, into the different meeting rooms? And so that's this project Melody that uh, 40 or so faculty uh, from across LSU and Southern and I have been working at. And again then, there's the question, how would we control that? And so here was one sketch again, if we look back at how people were using those clay counting tokens uh, 10,000 years ago, can we think about some funny little gorilla objects and some other sorts of parameter objects and move those about on a table size spreadsheet? By the way, if you wanted to, the word, uh, the word for abacus in uh, Roman times, you know, was talking about something that happened with Corinthian versus Dorian cobula. And it was basically um, Excel, which was basically a table. Yes, and whether you were buying real estate or buying potatoes, there were these counting tables. I uh, uh, should have kept an image of that. But we're again trying to say, if we take Excel and Google Spreadsheets back to that level, and we have a bunch of people sitting around, some things are gonna be done with the keyboard, some things with the cell phones, but maybe there are other sorts of the most important key objects of interest that perhaps want to be physically embodied, physically manipulable in different sorts of fashions. You're seeing something at, uh, one of the relatively recent supercomputings there. And so uh, if you weren't in this room, uh, Shantanu, who's here today, would be um, finishing up a, a video on this particular thing, which is actually taking that old real estate example and reviving that in the context of smartphones, smart watches, smart tokens, some of the tools that have uh, come about in the last decade that we didn't have a decade before. And one notion that reasonable reviewers will have when they see this is why. Why are you re-implementing that? And the challenge is that a lot of folks in this area that's of tangible interfaces on the HCI side do things, even build companies, and then those companies end up failing a couple of years later. Why? Well, most new companies fail. But what a couple of my really insightful friends have noticed and we're trying to learn from is coming up with great platforms and great content at the same time, brand new platforms and brand new content turns out to be hard. That maybe it's a little bit better to do one at a time and then once you know how to do both, try to find ways to come back together. And so in a sense, that's the tack we've been taking as a longer, slower, less sexy sometimes, but we hope saner path at LSU. Pushing hard even at the BioPython, lowest level things with the biology. Pushing hard towards domains that we don't care so much about, like the real estate here. And then trying to think now that we have some handle on the tools, some handle on the domains, how do those pieces come back together? So I'll show you a couple of the latest pictures and then uh, we'll break for questions. I see we're at minute 38. And so this is a remunging of that same image, um, an envisionment that Miriam, myself, and uh, collaborators in uh, Toronto and uh, Boston ended up submitting last month. How can we take those same sorts of tools that you were beginning to see here some physical tokens, some graphical predictive things, so that as Shantanu puts this funny object here, can it be graphically suggesting what are the most related parameters, most related data sets? Can we take several of those, spread them about, initially in one room, later in several rooms? 
Um, does anyone, this is probably hard to see, but there's one piece of uh, wisdom we're trying to come out of your uh, automobiles cockpit. Anyone done anything with your automobile in the last day or two that relates? This is probably impossible to see. Um, but it turns out that when you shift from drive to reverse, for instance, there are several different places where that can be observed. If you put your eyes down, you can see drive and reverse. But as you're doing that there, often on your dashboard, it's also saying drive and reverse there. Because your eyes are in different places at different times. And so here, one of the things that seems like a silly thing, but we think it makes a big deal, is as people are turning those objects, even as they're lifting those objects, we're trying to put a dashboard over here that's showing what people are changing, what people are interacting with. Doesn't make a lot of difference if you're one person, but if you're 50 people who are controlling something in parallel, seeing what the person is lifting, changing, thinking about in one of the other sites we think will be a big deal. And so here you're seeing those uh, stacked histograms all together, peeling them apart, uh, an envisionment of what that could look and feel like. And then there's one last vector we're taking here before I uh, wrap up with a final slide. Um, a lot of the interactions I've been talking about are minute to minute, second to second, this sort of interactive notion. But one of the big lessons as we've worked on these genome projects is the Marmoset project was more than six years long, just for the part that I was a part of, and probably several more before that. Um, you hear about uh, Cyan Flanders, uh, what, on comets and other things, where you'll hear this project has been launched a decade ago, yes? And so there's this sort of science that happens in the moment-to-moment -moment level, but also the science that happens at the month, the year, the decade timescale, even again, and how to experience that. And so this was a, a reskinning of a, a wall in the basement of Johnston Hall as we began thinking, uh, Michael and I and a number of us when we go to SuperMike are very familiar with the head nodes. You go with your, your command prompt again and, and push things about. What would a face node be? How can we again be expressing the face, the visage, the avatar of that computation in different sorts of ways? Um, and so again, if there's time later people are interested, we'll talk about how we're representing people, how we're representing cloud resources, um, or even the latest example we're uh, hopefully going to be uh, applying in the interface design and technology class beginning uh, next month, uh, for those of you who are considering. This is a wall in a teaching laboratory in uh, Coates Hall. And every name of every student who's done something vaguely related to digital media in the last decade is on that wall, as are, aspirationally, all of their employers. All of the other pieces of information that characterize their work with digital media, which programming language, which platforms, etc. And so the interest at some level is as people are trying to think, where, where will I go next? You know, what happened last semester? Can I point to a semester or two before in this class or another and see lit up all of the different companies, see images on those two stack displays of different projects that were involved? Or again, point to a company, a company like Microsoft or Google, a company that's a local company, and see all of the fellow students, the fellow alums, in a sense colliding social media space with architectural space. And so this is again one of those attempts both to see how things we're working on in the science domain would generalize, but also to apply something to a domain we understand a little better and then hopefully move that to representing those 2016 LIGO results uh, that I referred to a moment before. A lot of hand waving going on because we're uh, just really getting underway with that. Um, but hopefully different notions of going beyond the playing card size smartphone that all of us are so excited about and thinking, how do we bring that to architectural space, to look at these naked walls and ceilings and floors and think, what would it mean to light them on fire, uh, both in the biological context and uh, perhaps generalizing beyond? So I said I would end up with one final slide to try to um, come to something I referenced in the abstract. How many of you have seen Gattaca before? Two, three, four hands. Good. One of my favorite movies. I hope that those of you who haven't will. Um, this was an article from 2013, there were articles even in the last uh, month or two that I thought about bringing here. Um, but a, de a decision of the Supreme Court that because DNA is just like fingerprinting or photographing, that even if you haven't done anything, if people think you might have done something, they can take a swab from your mouth, archive that, analyze that, do other sorts of things in perpetuity. 
and to me, the big challenge is there's a lot of exciting with personal genomics and other sorts of things about your genome. But my sense is it's, it's sort of your genome, but it's your grandchildren's genome and your grandparents' genome too. And decisions that you take or a government takes may be able to explore whether they would be employable, whether they would even be allowed to be born. That if you look at many of the most impactful presidents of this country, for instance, both Roosevelt, Jefferson, Kennedy, others, had really severe health issues. Some of them survived office, some of them didn't. And to me, the challenge that is a challenge that the five-year-olds of today have at least as much to say about as, as the 40 and 50-year-old professors around here um, are what is the right balance between how much you can or should do with a, a DNA. I wear scars on my body because I was allergic to a certain antibiotic and we didn't know it. And that's probably very knowable in the very short time frame with the right genome. But if, if the cost of getting to that is that my grandchildren aren't allowed to be born, that's a pretty high cost to pay. And so coming up with the tools, again, that are useful for the scientists today, but hopefully sustain these kinds of very deep, very powerful conversations that will, I think, characterize medicine and at some level humanity for the next few centuries, um, that hopefully is uh, entangled with this work as well. So with that, I'll acknowledge uh, the many different people uh, in my team, uh, with Miriam's team, Mark Batzer's lab where Miriam works and others who've uh, made a lot of this work possible. And I'll thank you so much again for your time and attention and would love to uh, take any questions. Thank you. How was the pizza? How many different flavors did he have? <laughs> okay. All right, let, let me start. So uh, what do you think is the future of supercomputing? Because I would really love to see something more interactive that is right now. Uh, when I started doing this as a graduate student, it took me quite a few years to be able to comfortably use supercomputers. And that's a long time, right? So I see this uh, tangible interfaces and uh, interactive computing as something very, very promising that would make this technology available to everybody. So do we have a chance to uh, see this anytime soon? What are your thoughts? Great question. So again, a really influential thing to me is that when I was a first semester undergraduate a couple moons and campfires ago, the very first computer asset I had access to at Illinois was the brand new $15 million uh, Cray YMP. And they gave me a little ticket that gave me 500 hours of time, which was worth real money. And that was really exciting to be given that. Um, one interesting thing is if you have an Apple iPhone 5 or greater, that has more computational power than that $15 million supercomputer did 20 decades before. And so again, people do say the data centers of today, the hundreds of thousands or millions of cores at Google, are the desktops or even the earrings of tomorrow. So one thing we have pushed on is even with relatively modest assets like Melody, trying to get those into the classroom because some things are intuitive and some things aren't intuitive about how things scale up in different sorts of ways. Um, uh, we are trying to make access then and try to bring into different classes uses of not just the small Melody machine but other kinds of clusters. We're talking, I was giving a colloquium last month at NCSA with Blue Waters, one of the largest uh, currently existing public uh, uh, supercomputing assets in the country. Um, midway through its life will probably be obsoleted within two years but has three to 400,000 cores, uh, traditional cores as well as other GPUs. I think one of the biggest challenges even for us again is just beginning to have enough imagination to think what could the shape of computation be? Again, does it have to be something to be thinking mostly in terms of how you would interact with a cell phone and watching your job from afar? Or again, can we think in teaching laboratories, the next version of, of teaching labs for biology? Uh, I've been a, a student, uh, not enough of this semester, but some of it in uh, Dr. Ginger Brennan's school's genetics class, which has been just really, really exciting to me. I don't think there's a dedicated teaching lab for that yet. But how, if the, the future of that, we're not just wet and not just dry computational, but some mixture in between. Um, that's why I've been taking the class to try to, to come to better terms with that. So that's a long way of saying that's exactly one of the big questions that motivates me. We've made some traction thinking about how to interact parametrically rather than directly. So the way that that scales up may be easier to handle. Um, but uh, for those of you who are interested in the particulars, I'd encourage you to come by, talk with fellow students, and, and share with us your own ideas as well. Great question.
Other questions? So, uh, do you still have this wall up and running somewhere? So this wall we did in Johnson just before we moved out to our new building. Again, trying to think and envision. And one of the most exciting things we're hoping for in our new building is since we have all of this glass, mm -hmm. can we put some things behind the glass um, to, to wake it up, uh, both shaping privacy and uh, uh, lighting things up as well. Um, we're making a little bit more progress with the coats installation um, than with uh, the DMC installation at the moment, just because we have a class coming and we'll have 30 students to help uh, light it up. But we're hoping again to pivot to that back to coats for the spring and then pivot perhaps back to DMC with what we've learned um, come summer and fall. Any other questions? Vega? Do I play video games? I like the question. So um, I'll go with the answer, it depends. So when I was uh, 10 or 11, I was just starting to sort of get engaged with that. And um, my m parents made a special deal that if I uh, could pivot that energy to doing something that would help me get a job or with science projects, then I didn't have to do quite as many dishes for the next uh, little while. And so I ended up uh, winning a first uh, prize with the International Science and Engineering Fair, as well as getting out of some dishes. And, and that was sort of cool. And I was a bit hooked. Was interested in computers and ended up getting one of these thousand core machines back in 1990 to work with. It was sort of half military, half university. And at some level, the hope with this, and uh, where people are so excited about the gamification of technology, is I would probably have as much to learn from uh, someone of you who spent a lot of time with World of Warcraft as looking at sort of more staid, <laughs> straight from the biology lab things, and the notions of what are future representations of interactive uh, supercomputing. Certainly this notion of massively multiplayer, bringing lots of things together. I think there's enormous amounts to be learned from that intersection of what's sort of mainstream gaming and what's education and what, what, what's sort of the next generation of science. And I know that there are people at the National Science Foundation, William Bainbridge, who spent hundreds of hours studying, participating in World of Warcraft, and um, has really applied that as a serious science tool. I hope so. The question, again, do we think there are ways to think about spaces that are half real data, half fictional data, and dragging people, needing to, to fight the kids off because there's so much wanting to go uh, hang out on that comet and dig and other sorts of things. I think it, it comes to that uh, small but, but interesting challenge of, of realizing it in a way that, that makes it compelling. I was deeply humbled. In fact, one of my least successful and therefore most educational projects was very much along these lines. With LIGO, I got some state funding to try to bring this to K through 12. And I discovered, uh, I think the most insightful comment was by a professor in education here, Eugene uh, Kennedy, who said, you know, the Game Boy is a really tough competition. Unless you can out Game Boy the Game Boy, uh, then people will be excited at you know, what they have that's really cool. And, and it was tough for us to outdo what the gaming console. So maybe if you can't beat them, join them is a really good and productive uh, strategy that we should be spending more time with. Any last uh, question or so? Good question. Oh, Brad, thanks so much. Brad, OK, question for Brig. How do we leverage interactive technologies to get students from so in science uh, by the name of Aretha Franklin? And if she were offering uh, one great word a challenge uh, to Professors Brown and Berlinski and me and others uh, for, for engaging young women. It might end with a T. Any thoughts what that word might be? R-E-S-P-E-C-T, respect. And so I think trying to figure out, it's easy to say that, but trying to really understand what it is to respect um, uh, a young 12-year-old who's tipping on the edge of being interested or non-interested. Uh, I think my personal biggest asset is that I have a 14-month-old daughter who uh, I'm very inspired with for the future, and I, she teaches me every single day. And so I think at some level, just putting ourselves into more traction and being willing to fail more often. Because again, that lesson I learned was I tried really hard. I had some good assets, some good students, 
and we failed. And you learn often more from failures than successes. And if you have the gumption to try to fail and fail repeatedly, uh, from the Louisiana, again, those places where people have different ways of thinking, um, especially for the youngest folks, before we start as our brains ossify and think of the one true path that we did back in our student days that people must do for the next 10 generations. Um, I think it's an exciting time to be engaging with folks in the high schools, in the undergrad classrooms. And that's at some level why I've had uh, many more undergrads, about 40 to 50 by now over the last decade in my lab, even than perhaps graduate students for uh, getting things done, making things hopefully exciting happen. Thanks, Brad. Any other questions? Going once, going twice? Well, there's probably still some pizza outside. I thank you guys again on the eve of exams for, for coming and joining, and I uh, hope to see some of you, perhaps many again. <laughs>